angels minister to the nation of Israel. We have a ministry to angels as well today. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, that the angels watch the body of Christ to see this mystery of Christ, this manifold wisdom. We don't need angels to minister to us. We have the Holy Ghost. Israel didn't have the Holy Ghost dwell in, dwell in them like we have today, okay? We teach angels today. In fact, the body of Christ, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 6, Paul says we're going to judge angels. We're going to be the ruling authority over the angels. They learn from us, okay? All right. So don't worship angels. By the way, when Paul talks about these people who tell you you can send your angels out, I had someone tell me that. He said, give me your money, and I'll send your angels out to get your financial blessing. Well, see, I didn't know this. He tried to beguile me, but I learned what Paul says. See, I didn't know that intruding, Colossians 2.18, intruding into those things which he hath not seen. Now, my friend, if I use a King James Bible, okay, the authorized versions. The new versions changed this verse and says to things which he hath seen. See, Satan wants you to believe you've seen these, de these demonic spirits, because that's what angels are. If you see one, it's a demonic spirit. But Paul says you really don't. He's going to tell you what it really is, which you have not seen vainly puffed up. That's the problem, the pride, by his fleshly mind. That's a religious mind. They tell you, we've seen some things from God. We've seen some angels. We've seen Jesus. We say, whatever they say. And Paul says they have not seen it. See, you need to take your experience and allow your experience to go, be put aside for the word of God, the written word of God. He says you didn't see it. So look what he says. Verse 19, here's the problem. Colossians 2, 19. And not holding the head, capital H, that's the Lord. That's the point. Today, it's not about your religious experience. It's about Christ. What you're going to learn with the grace message, it's all about... God's riches at Christ's expense, it's all about him, none of you. All you do is believe. And that's what these guys are going to try to do, constrain you through religious fear. You know, religion puts a bondage. They say, if you don't, God won't. And what they do is they want to control you like a child, be a tutor and governor. That's what the law is, a tutor, Galatians 4. He teaches you what to do, but they're going to teach you Israel's program. A governor. They're going to stop you from doing this stuff. Don't wear pants if you're a female. You know, that type of stuff. Watch how long that dress. You know how it is. And they just put all the, don't go to the movies. Don't listen to that music. Don't dance. All the things that religion puts on you that God never put on you. God expects you to live before him as an adult and make wise decisions about how to live. The love of Christ constrains you to not go to certain places, not to do certain things. You know, because you're in Christ and you don't want to mess your testimony up. Not because he won't bless you, but because he's already blessed you. There's a different motivation. Religion uses fear. Grace uses love. You know, I'm an adult. When I was young, I did things that my mother told me because I feared a spanking. Well, I don't fear a mo my mother's spanking now. But you know what? I love my mother. And if she asked me something, if it's within my power, within the will of God, guess what? I'll do it. Not because I fear her, because I love her. And, and, and she's, my she's my mother, and I want to please her. Well, that's the grace message. You're an adult. And I don't have to worry about her spanking me today, but I still would do what she'd ask if it's in the will of God, because I love her. The motivation is love and not fear. If you can understand that, that's how grace works, as opposed to the law over Israel, okay? Go back to Galatians, if you will. Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. And let's look at verse 12 again. So when they constrain you, constrain means to compel you, to pick you up and carry you away. It's strong motivation. And instead of fear, you use love. Now, I told you what he says. He says they constrain you to be circumcised. Remember, circumcision was a covenant given to the nation of Israel. It's outward. It's physical. It's the performance-based acceptance. But look what he says in verse 15. Galatians 6, verse 15. For in Christ Jesus, now that you're saved, you're in Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. See, when you're in Christ today in the dispensation of grace, being a Jew or a Gentile, bond or free, male or female, 
Circumcised, uncircumcised, it doesn't matter your physical outward appearance. Black, white, Hispanic, you're in Christ. That's what he says, a new creature. A creature is a living creation. This is a creation. Somebody put this together, this thing made of wood, but it's, it's, not, it's an inanimate object. The body of Christ is a living organism made up of living creatures, a living creation. And that's what the body of Christ is, is a living spiritual organism made up of members of Christ's body. He's the head. We're members, one of another. That's what, that's what we are today. We're that new creature in Christ. Today, your circumcision doesn't matter. Your uncircumcision doesn't matter. Today, what matters is a spiritual circumcision. Uh, let's look at one more passage. Go back to Colossians. I want to show you this in Colossians 2. We didn't get to this one when I was over there. Colossians 2, and look at verse 11. Look what he says. Paul writes in Colossians 2, 11, In whom also, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, ye are circumcised. Now watch this. You know, I tell people, I say, Paul says we're not to water baptized. But I'll tell people, you need to be baptized in order to be saved. It's just a spiritual baptism, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. When Paul says not to be physically circumcised, especially back in his day, when he was big time, being a Jew back in that day, he does say that you need to be circumcised in order to be saved. But watch the circumcision. That's spiritual as well. Verse 11 of Colossians 2, In whom also ye are circumcised, now watch this, with the circumcision made without hands. You know, they take that little Jewish boy back in time past, eight days old. They grab him, they cut his, cut his flesh. It was a man doing it. Anything that man has to do, now I want you to think about this. Any outward religious rite or ritual that man does to you, whether it's you or them, it just takes away from the cross work. Just like that physical circumcision did, everything physical takes away. Look what he says. In the circumcision made without hands, verse 11 of Colossians 2, in putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. My friend, here's what God does when you trust his son, Jesus Christ. God the Father, you have a spirit, soul, and body. Here's your body out here. That's the connection to the world. Here's your soul, and here's your spirit. Spirit is where you make contact with God. Your soul is where your mind, your will, and your emotions reside. That's the real you. So your thinking process and who you are, it's where, it, what lives forever. If you're lost today, you're going to go to hell. Christ Jesus on his, and his cross work is the only thing that can save you from hell, save your soul from going to hell. Your body, when you die, is going to go six feet under or cremated or be in the sea, wherever. Now, what happens is when he says, Paul says, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and the putting off the bodies of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ, through his spirit, he, he, he cuts off the body, the power of sin, the, the, that, that flesh. He, 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 makes a, he makes a cut right there between the inner man, the, the, soul, the soul and the spirit, and that body. Literally, you're in this sinful body, but it doesn't have power, dominion. It's not your master anymore, Romans 6. You're free from sin. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, the moment you trusted him, he did a circumcision. He literally did a, phys a, a, a spiritual operation to cut the ties of your physical flesh, where the sin resides, Paul says, Romans 7, from you. That's why you're set free from sin. Now, you're going you're gonna to sin. You're not, never going to be sinless because you still have this sin in the flesh, but you ought to sin less. You ought to sin less today than you did a year from now. A year from now, if the Lord tarries and you're still alive, you ought to sin less because God sets you free from sin. He literally cut, just like they cut that flesh off that little boy when he eight days old, a new beginning. You have a new beginning in Christ, and when Christ circumcised you. He, he says, putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision in Christ, with Christ. Look at verse 12. 